All right, friends, take your seats. We're going here. You're having way too much fun, way too many conversations. It's not allowed. No, well, the best part of these gatherings always is uh, what does not happen on stage. So uh, we're, we're hopefully we've built in enough time, and hopefully many of you can gather with us uh, this evening. Uh, I'm just going to introduce Paul very briefly, and then uh, give him the reins, and we'll, we'll try to have time. We've, we've built in time, hopefully, for some more Q&A. I know many folks uh, didn't get to ask all their questions last night. You won't get to ask all your questions, but maybe some of them. Uh, and my job's easy because I don't think Paul Kingsnorth needs much of an introduction, especially at this point. Um, even if uh, you haven't read his, his books and essays, um, you've, uh, many of you were here last night. Um, but, but I did appreciate last night when he gave his list of, of uh, epithets, labels. Uh, one, of, one of my favorites is um, the one that he's kind of adopted as a recovering environmentalist. I'm trying to explain to people who don't know uh, Paul's work who he is. I kind of start there uh, and then go forward. Um, because even though he no longer engages in the mode of activism that he did uh, earlier in his career, it's not because he changed his mind about um, the underlying problems. Right? He doesn't now think, oh, everything's hunky-dory. This is great. We don't need to fix things. Right? But rather, it's that he refuses to settle for superficial critiques of our machine age and is searching for um, better stories and better ways of living. Um, uh, he, put, he put it this way uh, in trying to frame maybe the question that animates his work uh, in an interview a couple years ago. He said, why do we see the natural world, the wild world, the non-human world as just so much fodder that we can use and dig and mine and build on? That is a question that can um, certainly guide a frat boy's research paper, but maybe even a, uh, a more intellectually serious person's life. Um, so we're very grateful that Paul and his family traveled 4,000 miles to be with us this weekend, and uh, I'm sure we're going to enjoy this, uh, this next talk. Please join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I know these after-lunch after slots can sometimes be a bit of a graveyard slot, can't they? Everyone wants to go to sleep. You're all full of ham and turkey and things, but... This looks quite lively today, actually. Sometimes you look out after a lunch session and half people are asleep, so it's a good start. Um, please don't go to sleep for the next 40 minutes or so, just otherwise I'll just be offended. Or if you, if, some people can sleep with their eyes open, so if you could do that, that would be great. Um, so, yeah, so it's very good to be here, as I said yesterday. Um, this is the third time I've come to the United States, actually, over the last 20 years, and um, in order to fit in, I went out yesterday and I bought myself this shirt in a second-hand shop. This plaid shirt, Western shirt, they called it. So I thought I'd make, my, <laughs> make myself look a little bit American. So I hope you appreciate that. I nearly bought a Stetson, but I thought you'd be going too far. So, so I didn't do that. Um, but yeah, so this is my third visit to America. But the first one was uh, in 2001. In fact, it was September 2001. In fact, I was due to fly into New York City from Mexico City on the 12th of September 2001, which uh, unsurprisingly I didn't get to do. I had to wait a week in Mexico while they cleared the airspaces. And then when I did get to America, of course, everything had changed. So I never knew the country before that. Nobody quite knew what that change meant yet, but it was obvious that everything had changed. And it seems to me sometimes that almost everything has been changing everywhere since then, and nobody quite knows what that meant either. Now when I look back on that visit now, that first visit, um, it almost seems quaint given where we are now. I was writing a book about globalization. I was a young activist and specifically I was writing a book about resistance movements to globalization and I'd been in Mexico writing about the Zapatistas and elsewhere I'd been looking at anti-privatization protests in the South African townships and tribal resistance in New Guinea and street protests against the G8 and the WTO in Europe. Um, and I was in the States to visit anti-corporate activists and localizers and campaigners trying to protect the, their various communities against consumerism, big business, 
This was, a, this was a time when giant bookshops were seen as a threat because they were putting the small bookshops out of business. Nowadays, we look back on the age of giant bookshops, don't we, with, uh, with romantic nostalgia. <laughs> when there actually were bookshops on the street. Um, one of the groups I wanted to meet in New York City was called the Surveillance Camera Players. I don't know if any of you have heard of them. They was, as far as I could see, it was basically one man and a couple of friends, and they performed postmodern street theater into surveillance cameras, right? <laughs> to highlight privacy concerns and I went around Manhattan one evening with them and uh, the guy basically had a load of cards and he would cycle through these cards while standing in front of a surveillance camera and sort of pointed it. It was like a one-man piece of theatre. Um, it's all very situationist um, and the fact that it was going on in a traumatised city that was still covered in dust added an extra layer of something to the proceedings. Um, but as I said it was a different time. It was a time when surveillance cameras on buildings were the greatest threat to privacy. And it was a time in which surveillance cameras were actually attached to buildings instead of being in your pocket, on your phone. Um, and it was a time when people actually thought about notions like privacy and the public realm, if you remember that. And it was a time when anti-globalization was championed by the left instead of derided by the left as fascist. Do you remember that? That well, was exciting. There was a time in which keeping Starbucks off the high street actually seemed like a winnable cause. Um, yeah, halcyon days, do you remember them? Remember them when the progressives were suspicious of authority and argued for free speech and against censorship? Remember that? <laughs> but, uh, told you it was quaint. Um, now, when I walk around my nearest city's day in the west of Ireland, Galway, which I call it a city, but here you'd probably call it a village, um, I don't really even notice the surveillance cameras, although there are plenty of them there. Instead, I notice whatever the latest intrusive technology is. There's always something coming very fast. Um, quite recently I noticed the public toilets which you can only get into if you've got a credit card, no cash. Not only do you have to pay for the toilets but you have to scan your card for them. Uh, or the cashless parking meters, you can't park with coins anymore. Or the robot checkouts in all the supermarkets or the cashiers training you to use the robot checkouts and abolishing their own jobs in the process. Happily, happy to do that. Or the Perspex screens, some of the Perspex screens still up from the Covid era, era failing to prevent any viral transmission at all but preventing communication between you and the person on the other side of the screen. Um, and it seems increasingly that human contact is becoming a luxury good. I think is the plan. You'll have to pay for it if you want to talk to a person. But despite this creeping dehumanization which is happening everywhere, um, the west of Ireland where I live is still pretty mostly a human scale place. It's hard to stop the Irish talking or socializing and the Irish are much less efficient capitalists than the Americans, or the British, or the British. Um, my home city, London, which is my family city for several generations now, is currently the most third, the third most surveyed city in the world after two other cities in China, of course. Um, although these old-fashioned surveillance cameras that cover the streets of London now, are, as I say, seem a bit redundant in an age when everyone's movements could be tracked anyway via their phones, but a lot of them are being upgraded uh, to allow for facial recognition now. It's useful, so you won't be able to get lost in a crowd anytime soon, or ever. Um, and I've often thought that if they ever do get round to building Jerusalem in my green and pleasant land, as the great William Blake poem has it, it will of course be 5G enabled, and uh, full of retail spaces, and with ample provision for coffee shops, and 24-7 electric car charging hubs, what Jerusalem will look like. Um, sometimes I walk around and I see all this and I lie awake at night or I wander in my garden or in the fields and I feel like I can see all around me the veins and the sinews, the grid of this machine that's surrounding us and providing for us and pinning us down and defining us. And it's almost as if you can see this network of shining lines in the sky all around you like a kind of dewed spider web that you might see in the morning when the mist has been out. And I imagine the cables and the satellite links and the films and the words and all of the records and the opinions and the nodes and the data centers, all of the stuff that records the details of my life going on all around me, all connected. And I imagine this mesh kind of created by the bank transactions and the shopping trips and the passport applications and all the text messages I've sent and I see this thing, whatever it is, being constructed 
all around us, constructing itself around us, and I see it tightening its grip, and I see that none of us can stop it from evolving into whatever it is that it is becoming. See this machine humming to itself, almost like you can hear it humming to itself as it binds us with its offerings, little carrots, as it dangles its promises before us, reels us in. And the part of it that we interact with daily, that little glowing screen that people were talking about earlier, this little white interface, and you volunteer every detail of your life into it in exchange for information or pleasure or whatever stories the corporations are telling you today, commodifying your culture and selling it back to you. And I know, then I think of the words that we use to describe this thing, this network, this interface that we carry with us in our pockets. We call it the web, don't we? Or we call it the net. Both of these things are designed to trap prey. You're the prey. Sometimes I think that humanity as we have known it is about to end. And other times I'm pretty sure that's already happened. So, around three years ago, I started writing a series of essays on the internet, um, which was prompted actually initially by this ongoing culture war that's engulfing your country and my country, um, because I wanted to know what was going on and what it meant. And I had my own agenda, because a few years previously, I'd been mobbed online by uh, a, a group of woke nature writers. I don't know if you have those here, but we have them them in England, as I discovered when they were, went for me, um, who'd taken exception to some of my writings on landscape and place, culture and Englishness. Because post-2016, it turned out that the kind of stuff I'd been writing for years, which, as I said yesterday, is really about the need for roots and place and nature as a binding agent and tradition and the intertwining of nature and culture, all of this stuff that actually Front Porch Republic exists to write about. Uh, suddenly, this was proto-fascist. And by implication, so was I, um, celebrating or even feeling connected to your culture or your landscape was now problematic. Lovely word that, isn't it? Problematic. Ugly, ugly word. So I wanted to know how this had happened and what this cultural revolution was that was taking place across the West, because it was obvious that something had shifted. Something had changed at quite a deep level. Um, and it became clear, as I started to think about it and write about it, that what was going on on examination was, had much deeper roots than these online culture war battles were letting on. That what was going on on the surface wasn't really what was going on underneath. That the thing that had shifted was quite deep. This culture war was a sort of froth on the surface of the sea and something was going on beneath. So on the surface, for example, people might talk about race, or they might talk about immigration, or they might talk about nationalism, but not far beneath that, they're really talking about belonging and about roots and ancestry and history, all of this old stuff. Or on the surface, they might be arguing about gender, but underneath they're fighting about anthropology or biology or what it actually means to be a human being. Or on the surface, you might fight about abortion or even euthanasia, as we're increasingly arguing about, but underneath you're fighting about responsibility and family and individualism and what it means to be a human being. Or on the surface, you might be arguing about climate change. But underneath, people are really talking about industrial society and modernity and progress and our relationship with nature and what it should be. And all the time, everybody's arguing about meaning. Really about, we're arguing about meaning, the meaning of a human life. The meaning of community and place and nature and progress and men and women and reality itself. The actual meaning of reality itself, which is now up for grabs. And above all, the meaning of this thing that we've learned to call our identity, we, as we now discuss it. And when I think about the kind of online insanity that spills out onto the streets on such a regular basis, I do think of, as I said last night, I think of some of my elderly neighbours where I live in rural Ireland. In their 80s and 90s now, this generation that had to do everything by hand, if they did it at all. And sometimes I go around and visit them, probably not as much as I should, and we might sit and talk. And none of them talks about their identity. If I were to sit and try and talk to them about their identity, they would have no idea what I was talking about. Because they actually have one, but it doesn't matter, and they don't know what it means. So, to tr more traditional people, that's people brought up in a time which was harder, but also saner in some ways. The conversation doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense. And I came to the conclusion that you only need to talk about your identity if you haven't got one. And, come, and at the same time, you only have a culture war, you no longer have a culture. 
Otherwise, why would you be bothering? And I came to another conclusion as well as I was writing these essays, trying to dig into what was going on here, that these are the kind of arguments that people have, only have when the world is falling apart. Now, if that sounds extreme, rest assured, I mean it quite literally. <laughs> literally, not metaphorically. If the world seems mad in the 2020s, it's because it often literally is. Something really big, really deep, really fundamental is coming unmoored. We could, if we wanted, compare this time to, say, the collapse of ancient Rome, we like to do that. We've been doing that for 100 years or so, actually. It's the kind of gold standard for Western existential angst, the collapse of Rome. Um, the thing is that when Rome fell, if it did, discuss. Um, <laughs> discuss, discuss on Twitter at great length. When Rome fell, the world as a whole still worked. The oceans were still full of fish and and the climate was stable and there were no microplastics in the food and you could see the stars and everybody knew what a woman was and what a man was. Nobody had ever seen a screen or heard the sound of an engine. And even the most tyrannical empire had to operate within the bounds that were laid down by the living earth. Even the most fractured culture had a sacred center that it tethered its stories to. And that's not true anymore. No, that's true anymore because we modern people have fundamentally broken all these bounds. That's what we do. We split the atom, we coded the genome, we've inserted fish genes into tomatoes, we've inserted artificial wombs into women, poisoned the waters, we've poisoned the, our bodies, we've mined the blood of the earth, we've burned it, we've changed the climate, we've blanked out the stars, we've linked the entire world together into this giant web, this giant net of wires and radio signals and through each of them Every single one of us has become a little node in this big grid linked to its center by these little screens that we have suck us in and we can't take our eyes off these screens and they're rewiring the brains of our children. They're recoding their consciousness and ours into the form of machines. And we're thinking like machines. I've heard this before lunch. We're thinking like machines. We're becoming them. Some of us, some part of us wants to do that. And I think that the ultimate project of modernity, and maybe this is the conclusion I came through writing these essays, which, as I said, started off as a series of explorations into the culture war and then became something much bigger. Um, the ultimate project of modernity, I think now, is to replace nature with technology, to rebuild the world into a purely human shape, the better to fulfill our oldest dream of all, which is to become gods. This is what we're up to, and what I call the machine is the nexus of power and wealth and technology that exists to make this happen, that has emerged to make this happen. And we're increasingly unable now to escape our total absorption by this thing. I mean, we have to stand here and have conferences about how we can escape it, right? That's how hard it is to escape it. Um, we're reaching the point where its control over nature, both wild nature and human nature, is becoming unstoppable. If there's a reason that everything currently seems so existential, it's because it is. It is. This is a revolution at every level. Now, in his great study, The Myth of the Machine, Lewis Mumford wrote over half a century ago, a big, thick, brilliant book about where the machine was going, he wrote this. The last century, we all realize, has witnessed a radical transformation in the entire human environment, largely as a result of the impact of the mathematical and physical sciences on technology. Never since the pyramid age have such vast physical changes been consummated in so short a time. All these changes have in turn produced alterations in the human personality, while still more radical transformations if this process continues, unabated and uncorrected, loom ahead. Well, it did continue unabated and uncorrected, and so here we are. Now, I said last night that culture and nature were intimately intertwined. For that reason, this, this war on nature has become a war on culture too. A war on the memory, a war on the past, a war on everything inherited. And this is how I see this so-called culture war now, as a manifestation of our much deeper war on everything that's inherited. I'm not sure we even quite know why we're doing this, but the war's on. Western nations have embarked on this orgy of self-abnegation at the moment. 
self-hatred, ancestor abuse is all the rage. We live in a culture of inversion, you could call it, in which everything that was once a virtue is now a vice and everything that was once a vice is now a virtue. Seven deadly sins have been monetized, taught in business schools as case studies. Um, the sin of pride is cheered on for a whole month. I always enjoy that. Um, have a think about that one. Um, what does it mean when the institutions of a nation are occupied not by people with a small c conservative sensibility who want to pass on traditions, but by radicals who see their job as raising it to the ground so that they can build a world of justice and equality on the rubble? That's what's happening. That's what happens when a culture loses faith in itself for any number of very complex reasons. Because it's sawn away the branch it sat on. Now again, about half a century ago, the British cultural critic Malcolm Muggeridge saw where it was leading and he predicted that Western culture would die not by murder but by suicide. And this is what he said. The final conclusion would surely be that whereas other civilizations have been brought down by attacks of barbarians from without, ours had the unique distinction of training its own destroyers at its own educational institutions. Any professors in the audience, this may sound familiar. Um, and then providing them with facilities for propagating their destructive ideology far and wide, all at the public expense. Thus did Western man decide to abolish himself, creating his own boredom out of his own affluence, his own vulnerability out of his own strength, his own impotence out of his own erotomania, himself blowing the trumpet that brought the walls of his city tumbling down. And having convinced himself that he was too numerous, laboured with pill and scalpel and syringe to make himself fewer. Until at last, having educated himself into imbecility and polluted and drugged himself into stupefaction, he keeled over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and became extinct. That's the prose version. Around the same time, Leonard Cohen said the same thing in fewer words in his ballad, The Future, which I used the title for my talk. Things are going to slide, slide in all directions. Won't be nothing, nothing you can measure anymore. The blizzard, the blizzard of the world has crossed the, crossed the threshold and it's overturned the order of the soul. Don't need to listen to me, you should just go and listen to Leonard really. So you dig down and you dig down and you dig down and you get to this question, why does the West like to break things? I was quite interested in this question as I was writing these essays. It seems sometimes that the purpose of modern Western culture is taking things apart, permanent revolution. From France to Russia to Germany to America, from Marx to Rand, from 1789 to 1969. The aim is always the same, it's bring it all down, pull it all up. Examine the parts, put them back together in a better order. In the words of Ezra Pound, a modernist poet turned fascist propagandist, and the distance between those two things is smaller than you might think. Um, the modern West always has one purpose, make it new, he says, make it new. That's what we do, make it new. So the essence of modernity is the breakdown of form, that's what I think now. The breakdown of form, that's what we, what we do. It's like, a, I mentioned earlier, splitting the atom. You can split the atom in, in half and everything's destroyed, but from it comes this huge burst of energy. So you can create this giant new burst of energy that can do any number of things, could be directed towards Electricity could be directed towards war, but you have to break things for the energy to be released. Um, and the culture war is at least in part made up of partisans of the right and partisans of the left, both complaining about the consequences of the breakdown that they both made happen. And Patrick Denin puts it very well in his book, Why Liberalism Failed. He says this, what is bemoaned by the right is not due to the left, but to the consequences of its own deepest commitments, especially to liberal economics. What's bemoaned by the left is not due to the right, but to the consequences of its own deepest commitments, especially to the dissolution of social norms, particularly those regarding sexual behavior and identity. So Denin says that this great modern experiment that the West has been undertaking for centuries now is what he calls a titanic wager, that ancient norms of behavior could be lifted in favor of a new form of liberation, and that conquering nature would supply the fuel to provide almost infinite choices. And that's what's happened, except that the result of two centuries of this, which wildly accelerated in recent decades, is that we've built what Philip Reef called an anti-culture. Best definition I've come across for the thing we're now living in. 
doesn't really feel like a culture at all. It's an anti-culture. It's shorn of the things that actually make real culture. It sort of consciously inverts all of them, actually. It's a strange thing. And it's pushed forward by this strange alliance of progressives up, progressive ideologues and corporate capital, which seems to dominate the place now. Strange alliance which bamboozles all the old lefties and all the old conservatives at the same time. But it makes sense. Because what we might call progressive leftism and corporate capitalism are both totalizing utopian projects which are suspicious of the past and impatient with borders and boundaries and hostile to religion and superstition. The reason so many hippies ended up as tech billionaires. The borders are quite, quite, quite permeable. George Grant, the Canadian Red Tory philosopher, came up with a great quote a few decades ago again. He said, the directors of General Motors and the followers of Professor Marcuse sail down the same river in different boats. That was quite good. Except now I think they've abandoned the different boats and they're both sailing down the river in a big super yacht <laughs> together. And we're on the bank throwing rocks or writing essays about them. Um, but this progressive capitalism, this thing that's emerged now, that's come to characterize the 2020s, is a global engine for unmaking what would traditionally be understood as human culture. But what does it mean? What's a culture? And we raised this a little bit last night. What's actually everybody really fighting about? If we're living in an anti-culture, what would an actual culture look like? What's the basis of it? So I, I make all these complaints about what the Western left has become, partly because I used to be a lefty myself and I'm feeling a bit disillusioned. Uh, but in many ways I'm still a roundhead at heart, as we would call them in England. Um, because the thing that really irks me, as I said last night, is agglomerations of unaccountable power. And that's the human story right there. And the modern revolution, despite all of its faults, taught us Western people something quite useful, which is how to interrogate that power. How to identify a legitimate authority. I mean, this is the founding story of America, right? It's something that needs to be done. We need to know how to do it. But I learned that quite early, I suppose. But it was later that I learned something else, dimly and slowly, through my study of history and mythology and just people. And I discovered that politics isn't enough to understand what's going on here. It's not enough to solve the problem either. Economics isn't enough. Science isn't enough. These things matter, but they're not really the heart of what's going on. They're not the heart of what makes a culture. Economics, I don't think, is the heart of what makes a culture. Karl Marx thought that human cultures were built on what he called a, a substructure of economics. The economic base you have defines the culture that emerges from it. And therefore, if we could change the economic base by making it egalitarian, then we would have an egalitarian culture. That's the basis of communism. That's what the revolution is for. But I think that the substructure might be something else, actually. I think that it might be the thing that Marx dismissed and derided. It might be religion. It might be spiritual things, actually, that a culture is built on. <coughs> that every culture might actually be built around a sacred order. A culture is rooted in a cult, if you like. That there's a throne at the heart of every culture. And whoever is sitting on the throne is who you're going to be taking your instruction from. No getting away from that. At the heart of every culture, there's a throne. Someone or something is going to be sitting on it. That's what I think now not really amenable to rational analysis, but there it is. So who sat on the throne of this thing called the West, which is now falling apart? Well, we know the answer to that. The West was built on the foundation of the Christian church, and you don't have to be a Christian to recognize that. You hate Christianity, if you like, but you have to acknowledge that the moral bones of this culture were built in part from the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. Christopher Dawson, the medieval historian, wrote about this in his book, Religion and the Rise of Western Cultures. It was written just after World War II. He said this, there's never been any unitary organization of Western culture apart from that of the Christian church, which provided an effective principle of social unity. Behind the ever-changing pattern of Western culture, there was a living faith which gave Europe a certain sense of spiritual community in spite of all the conflicts and the divisions and social schisms that marked his history. Now that seems undeniable to me. Again, you don't have to be a Christian to notice that. So the modern experiment has been the act of dethroning. It's 
been a collective act of dethroning both literal human sovereigns and the representative of the sacred order and replacing them with human notions and abstract notions like the people or liberty or democracy or progress. Now, I'm all for liberty, I'm all for democracy too. I don't see much of it around, but I'd like to. Um, but the dethroning of the sovereign that sat on the throne of the West, that would be Christ, it hasn't led to universal equality and justice. I think we can agree on that. It's led via a bloody shortcut through Robespierre and Stalin and Hitler to the complete triumph of the power of money, which has splintered the culture into a million tiny pieces. The only way that we measure who we are and what we are now is through this thing we call growth. Growth is the only thing that matters. I don't know what it is like here, but where I come from, the politicians don't know how to talk about anything else at all. It's all about growth. Of course, as the great Edward Abbey once put it, constant growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. So this has been the irony of the age of reason and the, 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 the revolutions, the liberal and the leftist theories of revolution that emerged from it. From 1789 to 1968, every one of them ultimately failed to create this world of bliss and justice. But in destroying the old world and dethroning the sovereign, if you like, they cleared a space for capitalism to move in and commodify the ruins. The vacuum created by the collapse of the old cultural structures, however imperfect they may have been, was filled by the poison gas of consumerism. A system that G.K. Chesterton called a monster that grows in deserts. Capitalism is a monster that grows in deserts. It can't develop until you've destroyed all the structures that were there before. So we're cut loose now in this kind of postmodern present. We've got no center, we've got no truth, we've got no direction. And we haven't become independent minded, responsible citizens in a democratic human republic. We've become slaves to money and worshippers before the idol of the machine, which is what now sits on the throne. There was a throne, someone's going to be there. Now, these old taboos aren't coming back. Christendom isn't coming back. We're not going back to the Middle Ages. You don't need to want to either. You can be happy that's gone if you like. The point is not to make an idol of the past or to try and bring it back or to try and continue to live in it. The point is to recognize that when a culture kills the sovereign on the throne, the throne doesn't remain empty. You can dethrone Christ if you like. You can dethrone the sovereign of any sacred order anywhere on earth. You can trample the gods underfoot. But when you do, you have to understand that the sovereign, however imperfect his rule, may have been the only thing standing between you and the barbarians outside the gates or inside the gates. Leonard Cohen again. Now the wheels of heaven stop. You feel the devil's riding crop. Get ready for the future. It is murder. I was in a good mood when he wrote that song. <laughs> Probably just split up with one of his many girlfriends. Um, so what is the future? Well, we can see what the future is. We can see it. We don't, have to, we don't have to be prophets. We can follow the logic of what we've built over the past several centuries to its inevitable conclusion. We are going to use the grid, the net, the wires, the screens of the machine we live amongst to become the all-powerful beings that we always wanted to be. And now we've cleared away the culture and we've cleared away God and we've cleared away Christ and all that stuff, all that superstition. Get on with the business at hand which is rebuilding nature according to a better design. Our design, nature and human nature. Building it all again from the bottom up, getting it right this time. Okay? And that's a process that can only end with the complete redesign of humanity and the natural world as well, from the genetic level upwards. Logical endpoint of what we're doing. Dethroned God, now we're going to build a new one in his place. When your throne is empty, you will seek to fill it. You will reach towards Godhood yourself. You will seek to build a digital tower of Babel. You will, in the end, seek to design yourself a giant mind. Let's call it, say, an artificial intelligence, which will consciously or subconsciously fill the God-shaped hole in the culture. It will sit on the throne, even if you don't know that there's a throne you need it to sit on. So if that sounds unlikely or a bit hysterical or conspiratorial, and heaven forbid I wouldn't want to be seen as a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> again, um, <laughs> I would suggest that the metaphysical underpinnings of the, the machine 
are hidden in plain sight. You can ask the people who are designing it over in Silicon Valley what they think they're doing, and they'll happily tell you. So transhumanist Martin Rothblatt says that by building AI systems, and I quote, we are making God. Okay? We are making God. Very happy to say that. Martin Rothblatt, by the way, has invented a new religion called Terrasem, in which we literally worship technology. There's a website. You can check it out if you feel like converting. <laughs> um, another transhumanist, Elise Bohan, says, we are building God. Okay? Martin Rothblatt says, we're making God. Elise Bohan says, we're, make, make, uh, we're building God. Philosopher of tech, Kevin Kelly, whose book, What Technology Wants, by the way, is, is required reading on this subject, from, from a perspective completely the opposite of mine. Very good book, actually. Um, he says, we can see more of God in a cell phone than in a tree frog. Okay? That's what Kevin Kelly says. And when Ray Kurzweil, who is a transhumanist as well, also the head of engineering at Google, when he was asked, does God exist? He said, not yet. Okay? Not yet. If you ever use Google, which you probably all do, he's the guy running it. Okay? So this stuff is very clear. These people are not just trying to steal fire from the gods. They're trying to steal the gods. Trying to become or build the gods. This is what we do when we've cleared away the detritus of any culture that might have been focused on something greater than us. This is what we do when we've given up on the notion that there might be anyone above us, humans, in, any, in the hierarchy of life. Remember the chorus of that Leonard Cohen song, anyone? I do. When they said repent, I wonder what they meant. Great. When they said repent, I wonder what they meant. So, that's where we are. So far, so grim. Okay? <laughs> This is a King's North talk after all. That's what you're going to get, right? So, but I do try to be careful these days with too much doom. I have been writing about the darkness of the anti-culture for a long time, and if you stare into the abyss too long, it does tend to stare back into you, as Nietzsche put it. So it also generates clicks. Very profitable. <laughs> um, the culture war is a money spinner on left and right for that reason. We can't stop looking at the darkness. Um, but for that reason, I'm going to spend the last part of the talk doing something a bit unfamiliar to me, uh, which is I'm going to tentatively explore where some light might be found. So I'm sorry if this wasn't what you thought you were coming for. Um, but, you know, man's allowed his weaknesses. Um, I'm going to suggest, actually, that given that the West is responsible in so many ways for this unmaking of the world, given that our culture, our anti-culture, has done this at the, at the minutest level, then... Maybe our responsibility is to start thinking about the remaking of it. Maybe if the destruction comes from here, then at least partly the restoration needs to come from here too. Because the attempt to live without the rest of nature, to conquer the world, to rationalize it, to remake it from the top down and from the bottom up, that all started here. We started the revolution. Maybe we need to start the restoration as well. Those things always start small. Revolutions always start small. It's a few weirdos in a room, and then before you know it, they've taken over the state. Much to their own surprise sometimes. Everything starts small. So what does that mean? Where does it start in practice? Well, personally, I would start with George Orwell's summary of where his own explorations has got him to after World War II. He wrote, progress and reaction have both turned out to be swindles. I think he's a bad, not a bad starting point. Progress and reaction both turned out to be swindles. As I said last night, there's no going back to whatever existed before. You can't do that. No escape from the age of the machine for us because we're in it. So we have to go through it. But we have to go through it with our spiritual goggles on, if you like. Really understanding what's actually going on here. And for me, anyway, the, the end point of writing these essays for two years or three years, however long I've been doing it, has been this spiritual understanding of society. This notion that a society has this throne at the centre that every culture, whether it likes it or not, is built around some core, something divine, something we regard as bigger than ourselves. If you understand that, you understand what a culture is. As you say, you don't have to believe in the thing, you don't have to like the thing, but you have to recognize the thing. You understand that that's what a culture is, and once you do, 
then you can understand, I think, what's going on at the moment, what the metaphysics of it are. So writing in 1927, even further back than most of my current quotes have been, in uh, his book, The Crisis of the Modern World, a lot of these writers I discovered on these, uh, in this series of essays have been so prescient. I've been in, relentlessly reading people who 50 and 100 years ago predicted exactly where we were going to be, which uh, makes my work seem a bit futile, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you can, write, you can write this stuff forever. It doesn't change anything, but never mind. Uh, we just keep going on, don't we? Um, so René, René Guénon, the author of Crisis of the Modern World, he claimed that the power of materialist science allied with the values of commerce would cause the West to disappear completely if it didn't change its course. He wrote this, those who unchain the brute forces of matter will perish, crushed by those same forces of which they will no longer be masters. Once having imprudently set them in motion, they cannot hope to hold their fatal course indefinitely in check. And it's of little consequence whether it be the forces of nature or the forces of the human mob or both together. In any case, it is the laws of matter that are called into play and that inexorably destroy him who has aspired to dominate them. Think about that when we talk about AI, for example, as Jeff was doing earlier, and, so, and other people were as well. Uh, Guénon wrote a follow-up to this book in 1945 called The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times. Guénon was a French convert to Sufi Islam, lived most of his life in Egypt, argued that the modern West's decisive turn away from the spiritual life towards the purely material realm had plunged us into this era, era he called the reign of quantity. Reign of quantity, that's where we're living now. He called this the Western deviation. Western deviation from reality. And he said it had unleashed materialist demons which now threatened to invade the whole world. By turning away from spiritual truth, modern humanity had guaranteed its descent into confusion and breakdown. Guaranteed. So Guénon believed that the work to be done in the age of quantity, in the reign of quantity, and this is why he left France and became a Sufi in Egypt, was not political, it was spiritual. The only work worth doing at a time like this. Rediscover the eternal truths which have to be at the basis of any functional culture. Truth, he wrote, is not a product of the human mind. Truth is not a product of the human mind. All philosophers are immediately out of a job. Okay? But this is the whole basis of the Enlightenment is that truth is a product of the human mind, that if we struggle for long enough through science or philosophy, we can find it. And to some degree, that can be true. But actually, ultimately, it isn't true. Truth is not a product of the human mind. For the modern mind, that's a revolutionary claim. So writing about the same time as Guénon, the German historian of collapse, Oswald Spengler, in his classic book, The Decline of the West, another cheery tome, he wrote, that the failure of the Enlightenment was going to lead inevitably to a new search for beyond human truth, a new search for that uh, truth that Guénon was saying we had to try and rediscover. All of the theoretical edifices, he wrote, constructed by modern Western intellectuals and idealists to replace the old sacred order, liberalism, leftism in its myriad forms, conservatism, nationalism, fascism, all of them had failed, he wrote. They were all intellectual constructs attempting to replace the beyond human sacred order that we trashed. Spengler predicted that beginning in the 21st century, around now actually, the grandchildren of these revolutionaries and rationalists who are adrift in a failing materialist culture would enter what he called a second religiousness. Very interesting. So he wrote this, the age of theory is drawing to its end. The great systems of liberalism and socialism all arose between 1750 and 1850. That of Marx is already half a century old and it's had no successor. Inwardly, this means with its materialist view of history that nationalism has also reached its extreme logical conclusion and is therefore an end term. In its place is developing even now the seed of a new resigned piety sprung from tortured conscience and spiritual hunger whose task will be to found a new hither side that looks for secrets instead of steel bright concepts. Spengler predicted that this new resigned piety would lead to this religious renewal, which he called the second religiousness, and that would happen around now. But he said it would only happen 
when the collapse of the old order became obvious. Guénon said the same thing. Guénon wrote this, the passage from one cycle to another can take place only in darkness. Passage from one cycle to another can take place only in darkness. So what if we're in that passage now? What if this is the darkness? What if this is a kind of pregnant widow moment? The king is dead, the queen is pregnant, but we don't know what the air is going to look like. We're very clearly in some kind of state between one culture and another. On all of these battles, these culture wars, these ructions at the heart of things, these hubristic attempts to rebuild our own intelligences or run and manage and shape the world, I think it's all a result of our having turned away from this reality. This reality that at the deepest level, something higher than us has to sit on the throne. We've created this spiritual void. And in this anti-culture, we don't actually have a climate crisis or a poly crisis or a crisis of capitalism, or rather we do, but they're all a manifestation of the spiritual crisis at the heart of the whole thing. That's the result of my 30 years of exploration, and it wasn't a place I particularly wanted to get to because it's rather difficult to solve the problem. But this is a very old kind of sickness, this spiritual crisis, and it happens when we forget how to live in creation, whose light is obscured, whose source we've turned away from. It happens when the throne is empty. When the throne is empty, therefore, we have to turn around again and seek the light. So the question is how we do that. Well, uh, the thing that is difficult for me as someone who has been writing about this for a long time, I suppose, having started out in my early 20s as an excitable young activist, thinking that if I could just read enough or do enough or act enough, I could work out how to change the world and save the world in that typically arrogant sort of way that a young man has. Um, I've come to the conclusion, as I said, that this is a spiritual crisis and therefore it's not really up to me to solve it. It's almost as if I'm not very important. Uh, so that was, that was a good lesson. It's a good lesson, that one, isn't it? Um, so four or five years ago, some of you will know if you've been reading my writing, I became a Christian. I became an Orthodox Christian, and that was certainly something I wasn't expect, expecting or even wanting. I tried to resist that for a while because it was really very awkward, but it happened. Um, I certainly never thought I'd be standing before people talking about it. Uh, I still feel a bit uncomfortable doing that, but... When I'm talking here about the throne at the heart of culture and what culture means, I'm not talking in the abstract. The God on the throne is a real God. At least the people who put the God on the throne believed he was a real God. And you can't recreate that culture by pretending to believe in the God, going through the motions in the church or something. You actually have to believe in it. Now, I do believe now that this religious impulse, this need to connect to the divine, whatever it is, is inside all of us. It derives all of us on it. Humans are religious creatures. You can look around the world. There are so many faiths. There are so many religions. There are so many battles within those religions about what the truth is. But everybody is focusing on the divine, or at least every culture has its understanding of how to get there. We're religious creatures. That's the conclusion I've come to over 30 years. Humans are basically religious creatures. So that means any real human culture, if we're talking about our anti-culture and the new thing that's emerging, any new culture has to acknowledge the throne, orientate itself around this divine mystery, or whatever it quite is, people place prayer, as I put it yesterday. There's only one culture I know of in human history that has ever attempted to replace the divine center with a human one, and it's this one. Only one culture that's ever said, there's no God, there's no gods. We're at the heart of things, and we can see how well that experiment's working. So. The interesting thing about that is that the void we've created is now noticeable and lots of people are noticing it. Especially a lot of young people actually. I hear from a lot of young people all the time who can sense that spiritual void. In just the last few years that's become quite obvious. But they don't know what to do about it because nobody told them. Nobody told me either. The Polish philosopher Leszek Kolakowski, who used to be a communist and then became my great critic of communism, he once wrote that culture, when it loses its sacred sense, loses all sense. Culture, when it loses its sacred sense, loses all sense. So, again, the question becomes, how do you recover the sacred sense? Well, my feeling is that the answer is not by trying to repair the broken centre. Not by trying to repair the broken centre. Not, in other words, not through politics, not through economics, not through conservatism, not through culture or either. Conservatism only works when there's something left to conserve. And the culture war is a trap set by the devil, who enjoys his popcorn as he watches us daily, bashing out the words. I think that rebuilding a sacred culture, if that's a possible thing to do, 
is multi-generational work. It requires patience. You can't rush it. Cultures don't just pop up because we want them to. It could be that the seed of this second religiousness is already being planted right here and right now. I have a feeling that maybe it is. Little seeds everywhere being planted. So maybe our job is to tend the seeds and water the seeds. Taking René Guénon's suggestion seriously, we have to go into the dark to do that. Into the darkness between worlds. We have to go out to the margins to do that. When the centre is broken, you don't stay there and try and put sticking plaster on. You go out to the margins. The difficult, unwelcoming places. And that's what's happened before. That's where this culture came from in the first place. Where all cultures come from. When the centre of the field is, is corrupted, when the centre of the field is unproductive, it's, the, it's around the margins where the flowers are all growing. Because they haven't been sprayed with Roundup. Right? That's where the life is. Now, last October, I mentioned this yesterday, last October, one year ago and one day, I turned 50. And I spent the eve of my birthday sleeping in a cave, because that's the kind of person I am. I don't know what that makes me. But I was sleeping in a tiny cave where an Irish saint from the early Christian era, Coleman Macduach, had slept. It's a beautiful cave. I, I like to go there a lot. It's a sacred site. There's a cave. There's a holy well. Um, it's a wonderful place. Ireland is studded with these early Christian sites where the, the old hermits used to go to go and see God. And I, I went to sleep in this cave. I thought it would be a, a way to mark my, my half century. And there's a beautiful old holy well by this cave. The spring just comes out of the mountain and there's a, a little stone well that's been built. And it's one of about 3,000 holy wells in Ireland. It's got more holy wells, sacred springs, than any other country in the world. And I decided that night that I was going to set myself a little project. I was going to visit 50 of these wells, 50 holy wells in my 50th year. And I was going to take photographs of them all, write, them, write something about them and do something with it, just, just for my own pleasure, really. And I managed to get there. I managed, last week, in fact, I managed to get to my 50th holy well, so I was quite pleased with that. And I started writing up the results of this recently on my little substack. I do a holy well every Sunday, a little report. And I wasn't really sure why I was doing that, apart from the fact that it's just fun. I like going to these places. But I'm, maybe as I, as I think about this, as I've been writing this talk, I've been starting to think, well, maybe I'm starting to understand what's going on at some level. So visiting old sacred sites has always been a hobby of mine. I've always loved going to stone circles and old churches and holy wells and strange little edge places. Um, and I can't count the hours I've spent in these places, actually, lost or gained in the wandering around little medieval parish churches, for example, in England. Long before I was a Christian, when I was a young atheist who had no respect for religion and knew I was much cleverer than everybody else, I would still wander into little old medieval churches and look at the rude screens and look for the green men carved on the ends of the benches. Because there was some sort of connection to people and place and prayer, I suppose, that I was looking for in these places, even though I didn't know what it was, and even though I thought I didn't believe in any of it. Little places on the margins, always. The English poet Philip Larkin was a grumpy old atheist long before anyone had heard of Richard Dawkins. Um, <laughs> he wrote a poem about this. He wrote a great poem called Church Going, which is about being an atheist going to old churches with no one in them, why he was doing it and why he didn't quite know. The last stanza is really good. It goes like this. A serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, and are recognised and robed as destinies. And that much never can be obsolete, since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious, and gravitating with it to this ground, which, he once heard, was proper to grow wise in, if only that so many dead lie around. Serious house on serious earth. That's what the atheist poet sees when he goes to an old rural church in England. Maybe that's what I was seeing as well. And in such an unserious anti-culture, the attraction is obvious. Spengler's second religiousness, Guénon's renewal in the dark, all of this stuff it's going to come from people seeking something serious in the situationist spectacle of this postmodern decline. Where's the seriousness? Where's the truth? Where do I find it? Now, aside from my little holy world, the other obsession I have currently is the lives of the desert fathers of early Christianity and the desert mothers as well, actually, and the later hermit saints. All of these people who retired from society to seek God in wild places, in really difficult places on remote islands, in deserts and in forests. And all over Ireland where I live, as I say, there are so many 
remnants of people who were doing this. In Ireland, they called it the Green Desert, they would go to. And if you went into the Green Desert, you were seeking what was called the Green Martyrdom. Green Martyrdom, you went to seek God and fight the devil in these wild places. And the Desert Fathers fled Rome and fled Roman culture because life had become too easy and too decadent and too worldly. Now that Christianity had become legal and established, it wasn't possible to be martyred for the faith anymore. You could be comfortable and well paid, and they didn't like that. They didn't think that was Christian. They went off to strip everything away. And they didn't go to save the world or build a culture or bring back some political solution or whatever. They just went to seek truth. They went to meet God. And just in doing that, they created any number of things that they could never have foreseen and didn't intend. They sowed the seeds of a culture to come, actually. By fleeing the world, paradoxically, they helped to build a new one partly because they weren't trying to. So when I think about these caves and these wells and these silent churches and these marginal places where you'll find serious places on serious earth, what do they have in common? Well, all of them, I think, now represent the root of things, the source of things, literally in the case of a well. And here comes the water out of the earth. Or a cave, here's the entrance to the underworld. Go in here. Go in here to meet the devil. Go in here to meet yourself, which is harder than meeting the devil. In some ways, the four walls of a country church in the middle of nowhere that almost nobody goes to anymore. The steeple that points up to heaven. What are the tallest buildings in any society? I think they tell you what society is. What are ours now? Banks? Finance houses? 5G masts? What are the tallest buildings? In all of these cases, there's something simple and small and local and raw and serious. And in each case, there's a new start rooted in an old place. Going to look for who sits on the throne. There's a sentence in the novel Bride's Head Revisited by Evelyn Waugh, which somebody pointed me to recently. When the water holes were dry, people sought to drink at the mirage. So good. When the water holes were dry, people sought to drink at the mirage. Now, Waugh was actually talking about the decline of the aristocracy in England and the rise of new money. That wasn't really the same thing. But I think he could have been writing about the world here now, refracted through the screens. When the water holes are dry, people seek to drink at the mirage. When we can't find the serious house on the serious earth, we want the machine to create the seriousness for us. But it can't, because it isn't real. It's all fake. We're all drinking at the mirage in this anti-culture. We're all telling ourselves we're satisfied, but we know we're not. We know we're not, which is why that second religiousness comes along and will. So when the saints went to the wild, they were going to seek holiness. What does holy mean? Holy has the same root as the word whole. Holiness is wholeness. You're going to try and become whole again. In an anti-culture, in a broken society, that's what you need. You need to become whole, which means to become fully and truly human. In creation, the cave and the well, the retreat and the rebirth. I have this sense, just an instinct, that this is the work. Maybe not the only work, but it's the work I can talk about and write about. Seeking God in the wild places, stepping away from the monster, stepping into the desert, maybe not literally, maybe metaphorically. You can do this in the city in your own way. You don't have to literally be in the desert, but when the center is rotten or the center is exhausted, you have to go to the edges. As I say, it's always on the margins of the field where the flowers grow. The philosopher Eric Vogelin said, no one is obliged to take part in the spiritual crises of a society. <laughs> On the contrary, everyone is obliged to avoid the folly and live his life in order. Like that. No one is obliged to take part in the spiritual crises of a society. Is the West dying? Is the West already dead? You can debate away. But what you know is that when you look back at history is that the people who built this thing in the first place the people who brought it back from the brink as well, when the Vikings came and the Goths came, the pagans came, burned the books and smashed the monasteries and killed the monks. All of the people who brought it back again were out on the margins as well. They were mystics and martyrs and monastics and they dwelt on islands or in caves or in remote monasteries. They were ascetics, they were missionaries, they were scribes. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have a cultural end in mind. They were trying to follow the spirit wherever it led them. They knew, in the words of one of our modern prophets, Christopher Lash, that God, not culture, 
is the only appropriate object of unconditional reverence and wonder. If you're lucky, culture will appear when you do that. Culture is a manifestation of doing that. You don't fix the culture unless you have the right thing at the heart of it. And I think Lash was right. And if you ask my advice, which I suppose you must have done because I'm standing here, <laughs> um, I would say this, I would say step away from the screens. Then you're back on the culture war. Run a mile from all those people who have a 10 point plan to save the world, because they're the people you need to save it from. Okay. And I know that because I used to be one. So we're clever people. We think we are. Good at being clever. That's what modernity is about. We're not short on ideas or arguments or ideologies or statements or stratagems or strategies or proposals or clever machines or clever TED talks. Not short on them. But we are very short on saints. That's what we need. We need saints. We need their love and their wisdom and their discipline amid the roaring of the machine. I think the best saints, all the saints maybe, come from the edges into the center. Here's the thing. Saints don't just turn up. You have to make them. Saints don't just appear. They have to be made. And the difficult news and the joyful news and the challenging news I'll leave you with, I fear, is that in the time we have been given, it might be up to us to make them. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. A uh, good word on the challenges and opportunities of making a new start in an old place. So we'll have some time for questions and uh, just line up and uh, see when we get through. Go for it, Bill. Your bio for the program refers to you as a small holder. What is meant by that? I could look up on my smartphone, but I decided well, not to. Yeah, that's a <laughs> wise move. A small holder is what you would call here a homesteader, I think, actually. Although our small holdings in Ireland are much smaller than your homesteads here. So I have a two and a half acres of land. We, we do what we can on that. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you for the talk. Um, so speaking as a young person who's just kind of, you know, I'm 23, I'm starting out in life and I have to find my way in the world at some point. What steps do you think we can take personally to kind of, you know, fight back against the machine, so to speak, um, on an individual level and then like socially as well? Mm. Those are the really big questions, aren't they? I mean, it's so, it's so contingent on where you are and what you do and who you know and what your family think and the rest of it. But I mean, I would say, I suppose a few basic things would be, as, as some of the speakers were saying in the session before this, it's so important to find other people who, who are like you. And that's, you know, despite my deep skepticism about the internet, that's one thing the internet can be used for, right? Um, I mean, this, this is what brought us all here. So this is how we do it. Um, it makes such a difference if you can find people, I mean, ideally people who are actually physically near you, who you can physically meet, right? But if not that, then at least people you can talk to, who share your worldview, because it can be alienating living in the world of the smartphone and the machine and, and actually looking around and thinking, oh, this is wrong, but I don't know who to talk to or what to say. So really try and find them, you know, institutions like this are a great way to do it, but there are others as well. Find people who see it and connect with them. And as I say, if you can find people actually near you, great, go and meet them. Just go to a coffee shop, go to the pub, go to each other's houses, do that. I mean, we heard some, some great stuff earlier about what was, you know, some people who are doing that already. And, and I think there's a lot of, you know, I'm not, I know a great deal about America, but from, there's, there's a lot more opportunity that, for that here, I think, in some ways than there is where I come from, because it's just so much bigger and there's so much of a tradition of it here and there's so much of the homesteading and there's, there's the critique. So, you know, do that. and. And also just have an intelligent relationship with technology. As I was saying yesterday, just critique it. Smash your smartphone with a hammer if you possibly can. If you have one, I would recommend that. It's very cathartic. Um, but just really be very careful um, with how you're drawn in. Because it's very, very easy when you're getting started. You know, you need to go out and you need to earn a living. You need to move into the world. And 
very easy to get sucked into a completely machine dependent life and it's difficult not to actually and it's, it'll be much more difficult not to now than it was when I was 23. So see what you can do there. Um, just try and resist the tech. Just intelligently question everything that comes at you and find other people who do the same thing. That would probably be what I'd say. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> at the beginning of your talk, you uh, spoke about how we have conversations today, whether we're talking about the environment or abortion or it's always some political thing. But we're really talking about something at a deeper level that, we're, that we actually don't discuss. Um, and I'm wondering, for an Englishman, you're, you're pretty intense. And I'm wondering if you've had, if you could share any conversation. I've always wanted more of this myself when I find myself uh, in a political conversation. And I want to say something to remove it from that and to say I'm not part of what you're trying to get to, mm. uh, even though I might be. But the, uh, I, don't, I was just, my question is can you share anything from your personal conversation that you've done? And if not, if you don't have anything, I'm listening to your talk, I'm wondering if the question to respond to a topic like that might just be what you said. Uh, is, do um, you think truth is a product of man? But anyway, I'm just kind of curious mm. if you've had any success. You mean in terms of trying to divert the conversation away yeah, from politics? Say, I'm, yeah. I'm coming up this, because I think all of us in this room would benefit a great deal if we could start setting ourselves apart. Mm. We need the words to do it. Yeah, it's a really good question, isn't it? Um, because, you know, I'm, I, I've been involved in so many political arguments in my life. It's tedious. Um, and when I was younger, I thought that if you, could get the, if you could win the political argument, then obviously you've got to the truth, right? Uh, I, I think I spent far too long in my life believing that winning an argument was the same thing as being right. right. And it's not. It just means you're good at winning an argument. And that's a very particular sort of left brain tactic that we're good at. And yeah, I think really the only thing I can, I can suggest, and I'm not always very good at it myself, and because you get very riled up when these things happen, right? And you just want to respond and you want to prove everyone wrong. But exactly trying to find the words to just take it back to that deeper thing on which you often find people actually do agree. Because when people get into a political argument, everyone starts becoming very certain, right? Very certain that Trump's a fascist or, or whatever, whoever, whatever your position is. But underneath that, they're not really very certain. They're saying a thing they, they think they've heard and they're saying they're reacting against what they think you are. So everyone's reacting against what they think the other person represents, which is some kind of threat. So it's, it's, the tactic is to try and get beneath that and, and just say, you know, what do you think? You know, just if you pose it as a question, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Instead of a statement, I think you're wrong because if you were just to say, yeah, what do you, what do you really think is going on here? You know, why, why, why do you think that's happening? Why do you think we're arguing about elections? What do you think really matters? Often you find, I've, I've found this, if you can do that, you'll find that there's, there's a surprising amount of agreement just on the questions, not on the answers, but on the fact that people don't necessarily know what's going on. So if you can try and find some way to get to that bigger thing, if you can pull back from the argument and not look threatening and seek the common ground with a question, it can sometimes work. Not always. Some people have fanatical ideologues and they're not listening, but in which case, just don't answer. <laughs> I'm getting better at just standing back from political arguments. I'm still not always very good at it, but it's... It's actually quite nice. If you don't feel you're obliged to answer all the time, you suddenly feel quite a lot better about things. You just sort of nod and say, yeah, I can see where you're coming from, and then just don't say anything. <laughs> you know, and then, then people just don't know what to do if you do that. It's, it's, it can be quite liberating. So, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. But. Thank you for your talk. Um, you know, your you know, diagnosis you know, of going to the, um, the edges and... Um, you know, the margins and, you know, kind of building a new culture, you know, really rings true for myself. But I, um, I wonder what you say, there's, you know, some authors out there also writing who totally agree with your diagnosis of the situation and everything wrong, but that we still need to kind of, some people are still called to go and, you know, work the levers of power, at least hold them back, you know, in the American context, you know, working in the federal government so it doesn't crush and oppress the you know this, these small communities and i'm curious for your thoughts on that um solution or if that's required or if that's just working with the machine and yeah i mean i think it's a good point um everybody's called to do different things um not everybody's called to go out to the edges and do this stuff this is what interests me um it's what i like writing about um it's not the only thing to do um i, I certainly have a strong sense that you don't renew a culture from the center that doesn't mean there isn't anything left to do in the center. 
as you say. I mean, when the center is all powerful and it's rolling over people, um, I mean, I, I saw this happening during COVID where I was, um, unaccountable power rolling over a bunch of people or including me, entirely the wrong reasons. When that happens, you do have to stand up against it sometimes, right? You've got to stand up against it. You have to take a stand. Um, and I think that's important. I talked about this a little bit last night, that how you take the stand matters, but you have to take a stand sometimes. So there's no harm in doing that. Um, there's no harm in doing that at all. And sometimes it's a good and a necessary thing to do because we're all living in that world. We're all governed by politics and economics, whether we like it or not. I don't think it's where the renewal comes from, which is what I was really talking about, but that doesn't mean there's no work to be done there. Certainly, I mean, there is always work to be done there. And you can see examples of how useful things can still be done through politics and economics, right? Even in a time of decline, that's still real. So I'm not saying it's not necessary, but I think that if you're talking about actual spiritual and cultural renewal, that comes from the outside. But both of those things are happening simultaneously. You know, not everyone's going to go off and wander into the desert and seek truth. That's never happened. So there's a place for both, I think. It's also for your talk. Um, I was, I've been talking to Jeff about uh, the CS Lewis Space Trilogy, and a lot of your themes have been reminding me of that. But um, so one of them, uh, one of the things I found really powerful about that book is at the end, the, uh, the NICE Institute falls apart so fast and it's so much weaker than it appears. So just following up on your more hopeful themes, I mean, do you think that the machine is actually a lot weaker than we make it out to be at times? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? A lot of people ask this and it's very difficult to know, but I think that if you want to look hopefully on it, um, my idea of hopeful anyway, um, the, you know, the entire system is built on a foundation of, of extraction, which is hitting its limits everywhere, okay? Um, look, at, look at the so-called sustainable society that's being built to replace the fossil fuel society. It's all based on lithium and cobalt and everything else you need for the electric batteries, which is all unsustainable too and absolutely disastrous and requires modern slavery and mass pollution and is, is limited, possibly even more limited than fossil fuels. We're talking about mining asteroids now. That's a, sort, that's a sign of desperation, right? And you've got to talk about, hey, it's cool. Jeff's going to mine the asteroids for you. Ellen's going to sort it out. We'll go out there and mine the asteroids. When you have to start talking about mining other planets to keep your machine going, then you know your machine actually is extremely delicate in a weird way. So it is true that things that can seem all dominating can suddenly be exposed as not very dominating at all. And I do think that it is not possible to create an artificial intelligence. I do think it's possible to open portals for other intelligences, but we're not going to create an actual intelligence. We can do a huge amount of damage, but we're not going to build God because we can't. We're not going to sustain industrial society at the level it's been sustained. That's already coming apart. Um, and we're not going to continue the story of progress in material terms because we can't do it. We've already ravaged the earth and ravaged our cultures. Another 50 years of this, that's the end. So yeah, in a way it's actually I mean, you know, we might look back in 50 years and see that all of this stuff about creating a grand intelligence and building a technological machine to control the whole of humanity was the last desperate hubristic dream of the modern world and before it collapsed, who knows? But I think there's a distinct possibility that that's true. And I think we should probably behave as if it is true. Um, we're living in this age of enormously powerful tech. We do have to resist it where we can. We have to stand up against it where we can. But also we should probably assume that it's not as powerful as as its creators think it is, because they're fantasists. We want to build a god. Uh, and we know where that goes. People have tried to build gods before. So I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, it's, as I say, that's my idea of optimism. It's that actually the whole thing might fall apart very quickly indeed. And then we're going to have to find another story. You know, because this is the story of progress. If it doesn't work, which it won't, the whole story's gone. But then we're going to have to go back to the roots of things. So yeah, it's a very good question, actually. This is the last question. Give us. Ask there, Matt. Sorry, folks. Okay. Thank you, Paul. It was tremendous. In one of the quotes, you mentioned a term that jumped out at me, which was materialist demons. Mm. And that's an interesting concept, isn't it? I don't know if he was being allegorical, but what would a materialist demon be? You've just a second ago talked about opening portals. Uh, last night, you hinted at something that was interesting. C.S. Lewis uh, says, in the Screwtape Letters, I think that in some centuries, the devil tries to create materialist scientists by convincing people that he doesn't exist, and in others to create magicians by creating a fascination with him, the devil. And I have the curious sense that he's 
perfected his craft now because we seem to have both. We seem to simultaneously have scientists. Uh, every yard sign wants to convince me that science is real, as I didn't think it was. <laughs> Meanwhile, there were three different publications on witchcraft in the drugstore the other day. You've had a curious, fascinating, and circuitous route to Christianity, and you've you've talked about some of this in the past of things that might open portals. I'm curious your thoughts on whether we are looking at something that is kind of the same old battle between light and darkness, or if there are nuances similar to what you opened with about the difference between the world yet being pure naturally at the end of Roman today. Uh, is what we're battling something new? Is this sort of materialist demon something that requires a different sort of thought and approach? I'm just curious from all of your experience, what your mm. fingers are on that. We end on the biggest question of all, really. so I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer it, really. But I think a lot about this because, um, I don't know, if, if, if I was the devil, the machine is the sort of thing I'd create to distract everybody. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to have a society in which, which people thought that God wasn't real and neither was the devil and there was no good and there was no evil and, and it was absolutely fine if we harnessed the forces of matter to try and create gods? build ourselves up anew and, and dominate everything and use our left brain over our right brain and deny reality. And I don't know, you don't have to believe in the devil to see that that's where that story tells you. I mean, you, you, can, be the, you can be somebody who thinks the devil is just a symbol. I'm not that person, but you can be that person and you can still see what that, that symbol is. And you can see that in every culture, there's been a distinction made between good and evil. There's been a distinction made between the way of God and, and the way the opposite direction, and the force that is anti-God, which is also anti-life. And the force that is anti-life is the force that denies life, denies God, denies the reality of creation as a, as, as a group of creation, as a, as a collection of, of beings in itself, which also reflects the divine. A source that, a culture that denies life, a story that denies life is a story that says, Everything is just material matter, with no meaning, with no consciousness, no reflection of the divine, maybe no uh, reality of its own. And, and the only question is how we can manipulate it. As long as we manipulate it sustainably, it's okay, right? All the discussions are about how we manipulate matter. There are one bunch of people saying, hell, burn baby, burn it doesn't matter what we do. And there's another bunch of people saying, no, we have to manipulate matter sustainably, but they both have the same attitude which is that we have to build this great thing. But what if you see the world as alive? What if you see it as infused with God? What if you see every living being as conscious? What if you see us as supposed to be being in relationship with it, or as masters of it? Then you have a completely different view of the world. It's the difference between the view of somebody who owns slaves and, and the view of somebody who has an equal relationship with another human being. Uh, and it's, it is literally, or metaphorically, whichever you prefer, demonic and actually evil, I think. What's evil? Evil is to be against life, and we're against life, I think. We've created a system that's against life, and we're stuck in it. But then we have to be in favor of life. And, uh, that's how, how we do that in our own lives is up to us, but that's, that's how it seems to me now. And um, so it's kind of uh, spiritually uh, clear, but also much more complicated to live through as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the oldest story, you know, it's the oldest story. One of the things that Lewis Mumford talked about in that book, The Myth of the Machine, the creation of this machine, he says, look, this is not a new thing. If we think that this machine arose with the Industrial Revolution, it didn't. This is just the latest manifestation, the thing that the pharaohs were doing with the pyramids. He says, the pyramid and the space rocket are both very similar technologies. They're both things which involved a vast amount of labor and extraction of resources in order to create a chamber to take a tiny number of people to the heavens. <laughs> well, that was rather good. So, so in, the, in that sense, and we can read the book of Genesis as well if we like, will tell us the same thing. This is not a new story. It's just the old story playing out. We're in the old story. Um, we've taken it to new extremes. But because we've got the old story, we know what to do. We know how to follow life instead. So. But as I said at the end, that's the hard bit. That's our job now, I think, to do the hard work. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you all. And uh, <laughs> I believe. Uh,
uh, more refreshments outside. So uh, you know, use the restroom, get some uh, food and more sugar for the afternoon. And then we'll be back here shortly. I'll say one more thing, which is that there were, I think, four people queued up to ask me questions. You can come and catch me as I have coffee and ask me the question anyway, because otherwise I'll feel guilty. So, <laughs> but not everyone, just the, the... <laughs> Thank you.